We've had some great questions come through recently, and I wanted to address one question today, which I think is a fantastic point of debate. There are many and many opinions on the answer, and I want to provide my opinion, my understanding. It is in no way the solid answer, and I encourage you to seek the scriptures for yourself and find your own answers. But the question in hand today is: Is everyone saved? Now, to start answering this, I think we need to understand the story of Israel to begin with. The story of Israel before Israel even came into being, before the law, before the law was given, before an understanding of the requirements of God was even among humanity. Favor was still granted by God. It was granted to many people, and it was by His own decision. It was impartial favor. We have kings raised up. We we see through the story of Pharaoh that Pharaoh was raised up by God, but Pharaoh did not believe in God. He did not.、Um, he wasn't godly in any way, and yet God still appointed him, raised him up. So we see. Without the law, outside the law, before the law even came into being among humanity, it was there in the heavenly realms, but it wasn't among us yet. Before there was any knowledge of righteousness of sin, God was appointing people. He was showing His favor to people. There was favor given to Abraham and Lot by God to cause people's hearts to turn towards them. And as we see in this story of Exodus, there is even favor given to the Israelites before the law was given, before any concept was among us of God's righteousness. They were given favor by the by God from the Egyptians to pour provisions upon them as they escaped. So we have this whole story of God actually giving favor to people. So I want to separate favor. And faith into two different camps. So favor God. God gives favor to people. God just pours out His love, His blessing on people as He decides. This is not to be confused with those in the kingdom, because today we see a lot of people getting favor, getting positions, getting privileges, all sorts from from God. You can see it's from God, and yet we may question: Are they actually saved? Well, we need to separate. Favor from salvation in order to proceed through this. So then we need to look at what happens, what happened up to the point where God gave the law to Moses. Well, in the beginning, God established Eden, and He communed with Adam and Eve in that place, that garden, the paradise, and He commissioned them to go forth, multiply, subdue the earth, basically. Bring the blessing of Eden, the blessing that is being poured out from heaven. Bring it to the rest of the world, because the people out there need it. The world needs the very essence of heaven, the light of the world. Without it, it's dark. Without it, it doesn't know God. And so that was the original intention of God: was to have this source, if you like, of radiance of His light. Outward to the world, spread out, to expand the kingdom of God and to bring it to people outside of His knowing. And we'll we'll see why it's about knowing much later in today. So we see it's it's not a question of well, are you favored by God? It's actually a question of faith. So as we look through the Old Testament examples, the very first one we see is actually Abel. Abel gave a sacrifice to God that was considered right, righteous. It was by faith, and Cain's sacrifice was not in faith. That was the issue. So it is faith that pleases God. Faith doesn't guarantee favor, but faith guarantees that connection. And that's what we're looking for here. What? Where is that connection? Abraham had faith, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. He came from a background of paganism, 
And yet God chose him before he even believed in God. God pursued him. And this is another theme we need to hold on to, that God pursues us. And Abraham responded with faith. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Enoch walked with God and he was taken. He had faith in God. And Noah, God chose Noah to save the world from the flood. So the flood, the deluge came, it wiped away wickedness from the earth, but God decided to deliver the earth, the people of the earth, the animals of the earth through Noah and the ark, and it was done by faith. It could not be done without faith. And you can read all of this in the book of Hebrews. There's a fantastic chapter about the heroes of faith, and it tells you every single thing was done by faith and it is faith that counts so it is not how good you are it's not can you keep the law it's not are you a, a jew are you not a jew are you a christian are you not a christian if you want to apply labels it's actually do you have faith in god do you have faith in jesus christ that's the pertinent question here so let's let's move on so what is salvation is the question I want to throw back. Because we say, oh, you know, believe in Jesus, you'll be saved. God so loved the world, he sent his only son not to condemn it, but to save it. But what does that actually mean? Well, salvation in, in those contexts means wholeness. But then you have to take it back. I'm just flipping through my notes here I've made. What is wholeness? Wholeness was understood from a Hebrew point of view as you are either in alignment with the kingdom of God and his order, his designed order, or you're out of kilter with it. So it's like, are you straight? Or with the, so imagine this is the will of God and his order designed for your life. Are you in line with it? Or are you out of kilter with it and going away from it? That's kind of what it means. So wholeness, God so loved the world, he didn't want to condemn it because it's gone astray. He wanted to bring it into alignment again with his kingdom so that we walk in tandem with the will of God and his designed order. So when Jesus said the kingdom of God is among you, what he was talking about was, hey, I'm restoring things back to my original intent. The order of God is among you. The kingdom has come. Salvation is here. So when we talk about being saved, we talk about coming into alignment with the Father in heaven. Now, primarily, this is a spiritual alignment, but it also has fallout consequences into the physical, into the natural, into provisions, into wellness, into family, into relationships, bringing everything back into that order that God has designed. That's his intention. So the answer is, does everyone get saved? Does everyone come into the alignment with the kingdom of God? And the answer is, God wants everyone to be into alignment with his will, his order, his design for us. We see that right in the book of Genesis, where God commissioned Adam and Eve to go forth into all the earth and basically subdue it, bring the kingdom of God there. But they failed. But this is still God's passion, still God's intent, is to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the order, the holy order of God, into all the world. Every single dimension, every single reality, every single realm, whether it's business, natural, physical, spiritual, supernatural, every single realm, God wants to redeem back to his original plan and purpose. And we'll look into that as well today. <clears throat> But there's another thing which we need to consider in response to this question, and that is the, the subject of eternal life, because this is really the crux of the gospel. Eternal life is granted to those who believe in the name of Jesus. When Jesus was um, dialoguing with the women who were ministering to him, Mary Magdalene, his mother, and the, uh, the others, <clears throat> Jesus basically says... He is the resurrection and the life. And this is the resurrection. This is what they were waiting for. They wanted the life. They weren't concerned with, am I saved? Am I not saved? 
They knew this, this life is temporal, but they had their hearts hooked into eternity. But to get eternity, they needed eternal life. They needed the resurrection where everything is made new in Christ. You're given a new body. You're given a new mind. You're renewed, totally renewed in the likeness of the glory of Jesus Christ, designed as God intended you to be. This is what they were waiting for. And this is, this is the crux. We need to be focused on actually, am I in eternal life? Is that my inheritance? Do I know Jesus Christ? And then we flip that. And as the New Testament writers wrote, actually, you know God or rather you are known by God. It says that. It says rather you are known by God. This is the issue at hand. Are you known by God? You might ask, how do I get known by God? It's by faith. God is pleased by faith. Do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Do you have faith in God above? That's what it comes down to. That's what it boils down to. Because the, the thing of the cross, the crucifixion of Christ, it opened the floodgates of heaven for all. And this is where this question originates from. It's for all. But you still need faith to please God. You need faith to uh, to really connect with God. He's already pursuing us. He's knocking on the door of your heart. But actually, it's faith in him that opens that door. It's faith in him that gets you connected with his spirit. And this knowing, it is actually an intermingling of spirit. It's kind of the same idea that the old testament talks about when a man knew a woman and we know that was in intimate relation and what this is talking about is spirit is you knowing god or rather god knowing you it's that intimate spirit interconnection between your spirit and god's spirit and this is what happens when you get born again so really the question is can or will everybody be intermingled in spirit with God? Will everybody know God? Will everybody be known by God? The answer is God wants it. God is pursuing us radically. We're going to see that as we move through the uh, Gospel of John over the mentoring sessions. If you're interested in that, come along to the mentoring sessions through my Patreon. But we're going to see that actually this is a relentless pursuit by our Father in heaven for our hearts because he wants to know us. But the question is, do you know him and does he know you? And the answer is faith in Jesus Christ. It unlocks the door of your heart to welcome in the Holy Spirit of God to connect with your spirit. And then as you are connected with God, the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven flows into you. The inheritance of salvation, which is eternal life. And that's the ultimate goal here. So as we go through, we see that actually it is faith that counts towards God as righteousness. It's not whether or not you are born and have a kind of legal right according to the Old Testament law, the Old Covenant. It's not that that counts. It's faith. Abraham had faith, Moses had faith, Joshua had faith, the judges had faith, da David had faith, Solomon had faith, Daniel had faith. The prophets held faith so honorably in their hearts, in their soul, in their spirit, in their mind. When they were persecuted, sawn in half, beheaded, boiled alive, torn to pieces. They had faith. That's what they held on to. They saw the realities of what they prophesied about the Messiah to come. And they hold on to that faith in God. Because that's what counts. It is faith that counts. So then we skip to the end. In the book of Revelation, we get this picture of the end. And this is also mirrored in the Old Testament prophets. You can read about it in the book of Daniel specifically about the, the end days. Where we appear before the judgment seat of the Ancient of Days, the Almighty God. The books are opened. And these books contain everything that was said and done. Everything. 
And then the book of life is opened. And it says whoever's name is written in that book of life enters eternal life. That's the goal here. It's eternal life. How do you get your name written in that book? Well, it belongs to the, to the God. He writes your name in. And once your name is in, it cannot be removed. And Jesus gives us a clue. He says, actually, every sin will be forgiven you. Every sin. But there is one that cannot be forgiven. Because it is the key to entering eternal life. And if you do not possess that key, you can't get in. And that sin is actually saying the Holy Spirit is evil. It's actually saying God is evil. So that is what Jesus talks about, the unforgivable sin. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It's saying things about the Holy Spirit that aren't true about the Holy Spirit. Now, this can only come towards those who've known the Spirit, who've known God, know the truth about God, and reject it. That is made clear by Jesus in the Gospels, that this rejection of God is what cannot be forgiven. Because you've been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and you've chosen to say no. Actively, no, after knowing God. And have God know you, you choose to reject. So if that's the situation, then there remains no salvation. And it talks about those coming close to being cursed, close to being thrown out, etc. It's all the old covenant language. And it's written to those who are practicing the old covenant. And it was made to, to shake them up and make them realize they need to come under grace. Because the crucifixion of Christ brings you under grace. It is the grace of God lavished upon you that gives you the wholeness, the alignment, the salvation of the kingdom of God. And it is his grace by your faith in him that grants you the inheritance of eternal life that will be granted to you in a transformation at the resurrection. But then there is this thing that happens at the judgment where everybody is judged, whether you are in Christ or you are out of Christ. Everyone is brought before that judgment seat of God. It's where God takes account of everything we've done, puts all the things we've done through this kind of spiritual furnace. The fires prove and test your life, and out of it comes a reward or lack of reward. That's what that process is about. It's not about are you going to be entering the kingdom of God or not. No, that process starts when you're when Jesus looks at the book of life, and if your name is in there, you go on to eternal salvation, eternal life, internally living in the order and righteousness of God. But God also may deem it necessary that there are those who did not hear the law. They did not hear the Old Testament, the Old Covenant law. They did not hear about Jesus Christ, but they still had faith in God. Somehow, deep within their hearts, they had this faith, this small faith. It's open to interpretation whether God has mercy and grace upon them to bring them in, that the, the, the cross of Christ may cover them. We're not given the entire answers in the Bible, and so we cannot really draw a solid theological conclusion. But the possibility is there. <clears throat> but what we are know is guaranteed is if you are known by God and know God, then you are granted that eternal salvation. And the rest is up to God to judge and decide. We see that through the book of Job. If you've been following my Bible studies through the book of Job, towards the end we see this question about judgment of the wicked and the righteous. And after weighing it all up with all the earthly wisdom, the response was, who am I to question God? He is far higher than my ways. He is impartial. He has mercy and favor upon who he decides. And it is not my ability to comprehend that. I just cannot. I cannot comprehend his ways. So God may decide to have favor and mercy upon someone. It's a totally his decision. But would you want to place yourself in that position and take a chance? When he has given you a guaranteed, I love you. I've made myself known in Jesus Christ for you. Accept me. 
That's the call of God. He's made himself known in Jesus Christ to us that we may inherit eternal life. He's made it easy for us. So basically, is everyone saved or not? Well, if you're not known by God, then it comes down to his mercy, his grace, his decision, and he's impartial. So who knows? Who knows what God will decide? I wouldn't want to jump to, to an answer. I wouldn't want to jump to a conclusion, but I'd want to hold it open in grace and mercy. But at the same time, hold that the guaranteed salvation is in Christ and there is no other route to salvation. The only other way in is by his decision and his mercy. So let's consider what the New Testament says. All things are redeemed in Christ. All things. Many people have said all in the original language means all. And they go to the lengths to say even Satan and the demons are saved. Now as we go through um, the book of John in, in the mentoring sessions over the next several months, we're going to trace this through. We're going to see that actually there's a line that this inheritance, this salvation, this coming into alignment with the kingdom of God for eternal life actually is reserved for humans. And what happens to these fallen angels? Well, we begin to see that actually they cannot understand God. And it is the lack of understanding which means lack of knowledge. So they cannot know God. They have chosen to reject, they have lost their place in heaven, and there remains no salvation for them. They've chosen to dwell in the darkness, away from the light of God, away from the light of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see this as we walk through the book of John, the gospel of John. But what does it mean that all things are redeemed? All things are restored? Well, we need to understand what... The Satan, or should I say the accuser, deceiver, the murderer, the liar, the thief. What he was designed to do. He was designed to guard humanity and represent God to humanity and humanity to God in the angelic order. This is not the same as the Messiah. It's not the same as Adam and Eve. It's actually within the angelic realms. Seated as a guardian cherub on Mount Zion. But he rebelled. He was cast down, he lost that position, he lost the title, he lost the privilege, he lost everything. And so did those who followed him. So what remains for them? Well, up until the cross, he had the keys of death and Hades, the fear of death. Basically, he was the destroyer, he was able to destroy your life, destroy everything about you. And he still wages war, don't get me wrong, he still wants to do that kind of stuff against humanity. Because we're the image of God. But actually, death has no power. Death has no sting. Because through the crucifixion, Jesus disarmed the devil. Disarmed Satan and all the agents of darkness. He took away the power of their weapons. He took the keys of death and Hades and he unlocked the gates of death. So that the souls en enclosed in death could come out into righteousness. How do we know this? Well, there's historical records by Josephus of souls of the righteous. People who passed away hundreds of years before Christ came out of their graves at the time of the crucifixion and went into the holy city to tell of the wonders of God. Jesus himself said to the, the person on the cross next to him, today you will be in paradise with me. Why? Because that person professed faith in Christ. Immediately, you're in paradise with me because of your faith. So we see that man did not enter death. He went into paradise straight away. So this is the redemption deeming of all things, that actually that power that Satan held, that he should not have held, was given back, taken back by Christ. That place of Sheol, of the grave, of Hades, 
or wherever it is that you want to call it, hell, whatever, that place of darkness, of utter darkness, it's no longer where we go when we die. We enter into paradise with Jesus if we know him and we're known by him by faith. That's the promise. So you see what has actually been done in that redemption is we're taken straight into the place where God designed us to be, in his presence, in his glory, in his light. That is the redemption of the realm of death through Jesus Christ. And that power which Satan held, the power of death, is removed from him. So of course, it says in the book of Revelation, when he saw he was thrown down to earth, he was furious and he made war against the Christ and his and the children of God, the church. Because everything he had has been removed by Jesus. It's been put back in its rightful place. That's kind of what it means that God, through Christ, has redeemed and restored all things. But also redeemed and restored the angelic flow the heavenly powers that flow down from heaven minister through us. They come and they minister to us. They empower us. They are getting involved in everyday life. We can't see them, but they are among us. The agents of heaven. And the agents of darkness are being put asunder. Submit to God and the devil will flee from you. That's the scriptures. Now, I've gone on a bit of a tangent, but I wanted to cover that question as well. So, is everybody saved? Well, everybody is invited to know God. Everybody is invited to receive the Holy Spirit and have eternal life as your inheritance. The Bible makes it clear that some will be deceived. Some will go astray. Some will live a very vibrant life in Christ and some will not. Some will know him and some will not. Some will, after knowing him, reject him outright. And so you see, the answer is actually a spectrum. There's guaranteed salvation and inheritance of eternal life. And there's those that won't know God. If you like this video and would like more mentoring or teaching materials on the biblical perspective of these spiritual gifts, why don't you join me on my Patreon? It's www.patreon.com forward slash Christian Seer. If you like this video, please give me a like below, subscribe and follow and leave a comment below. Let me know if you have any questions, any thoughts. I love to hear from you and I look forward to you joining me for the next video, which will be coming soon.